uh, Project Daddy and Charm Guy <laughs> evaluating Hitler and some of the, you know, not so bad points of him. The greatest American alive. Speaking of manhood and masculinity as it pertains specifically to black men, because that's kind of my, that's who I'm talking to first, because you got to grow up. If you're going to make it in this world and, and advance, you're going to have to grow up and be on level playing field with others who do not give a fuck about where you're from, what you've been through, because they may have felt like they've been through worse. If you got this immigrant guy coming from a third world country where they could barely, they sleeping on dirt floors, and he come over here, he, he got, he's intentful. He's coming to win. The thing about gang culture, man, I feel like it takes up a lot of our time as a whole. I just think it's like, I, if we're being honest, I don't know if we have the honest conversation about it. Like, I'm seeing guys like Wack 100, you know what I'm saying? Just yeah. like, um, get into nonsense when he could be more of a, a, a better leader. You know, I like what Charleston White is doing. I really do. I, I, he's very antagonistic. It's going to be painful co- getting the conversation started. And that's what he's saying. W- what do you think about that? What's your thoughts on that? I think that gang, gang culture, gang ideology, I think it could be very powerful if used correctly. In prison, it's used not to get beat up. You know, it's used to have some type of political power, political sway. And while you're incarcerated out here on these streets, when it's used against other black men or other men in the community, it's it's highly destructive. It's not being angled the right way. I think it could be an extremely beneficial tool. Black organizations are beautiful when used the correct way, mm-hmm. but too often it's co-opted by corporate money. But uh, I think most of those major gang um, gang institutions they have enough corporate power to to actually push something that generated capital not only for themselves but for the little homies. Why don't they? Man. <laughs> But well, once you start making money, you have to protect your money. You have to protect yourself and your money. You know, all of a sudden the price goes up, security goes up, you know, the cost of movement just goes up. And then you get comfortable. It feels good. Hey, rich niggas become so feminized and they still act masculine. You know what I'm saying? They ha- they get more med- manicures and pedicures than the average woman does. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They get their hair done more than the average woman does. Yeah. They get their hair, you know, like the upkeep for a rich nigga it's a lot <laughs> his skin routine is better than his bitch's skin routine shit <laughs> yeah man i mean i think overall as your as your financial position changes your taste changes it just it just you know what's the there's a couple of different movies that point this out you ever seen trading places yes that one of the best like it, it, towards the end eddie murphy's like them niggas he's like no nah, he should have known better what is this guy doing like that it was a great experiment, but that tends to happen when your class changes. You believe your bullshit. Yeah, no, you you do. My hard, my hard work really got me here, and those niggas really don't work that hard. Yeah, right. Like you'll say that to a man who just worked sixty hours doing manual labor and say he doesn't work that hard or he's not that smart. But without him, you don't have no roads because he's been in rebar. We don't we don't salute these people who are doing really difficult jobs that give us the infrastructure to exist. We glamorize a nigga who says somebody else's words. That's fascinating. The working class isn't respected. The working class is taken advantage of. I think when Trump is saying make America great again, we all assume it's talking of a time when it was great for just white people. But if we were able to go back in our history and look at what happened after World War II, I'm sure you'd find that your grandparents benefited from it too, even if you're black. Being able to uh, work at used, uh, Howard Hughes, you know, he had a company used to, uh, my great granddad worked there, these 30 year jobs, uh, you know, a white man was facilitating that. I'm I'm giving some some fact here, you know, I'm not just what it is, just take it for what it is. He worked there. Uh, he was able to buy a home, take care of his family. Even in these gen- the Jim Crow era, uh, the segregated South, black people were still able to get some type of work and be able to take care of their family. So, no, it wasn't just great for the white man. It was also for us. I think the working class was respected. It was understood that I could go here as long as I was doing what I was supposed to do and I could work in this place for 30 years or whatever, 20, 30 years and retire. And that's just gone away. And and just how we look at the service industry, uh, the automobile industry, all that. It's just, we don't really give a fuck. Greed has definitely taken over. It's done something to the world. You get mad at me if I tell you honest facts, right? This really bad guy called Hitler. He had this idea that every German citizen should drive a decent car. He had this idea that every German citizen should have a good job. And so he created this infrastructure. Right now, to this day, Germany still uh, maintains the majority of their manufacturing. It's not outsourced. And so to this day, they still have one of the strongest economies on the planet. 
because he actually thought that their people should do the works and to do the jobs that build their communities. Whoa, that's such a radical idea to actually care about your people. But for me to be a black nationalist, you'll get mad at me. you say, don't be a black nationalist. Don't be conservative. Hey, someone has to create the money that you're spending, all right? <laughs> you know, we're talking about Hitler. Because... <laughs> I could imagine somebody looking at this and like, they're actually two, two black men, uh, Project Daddy and Charm God, <laughs> evaluating Hitler and some of the, you know, not so bad points of him. But, you know, Hitler actually took a country out of poverty. He brought a country out of like, you know, there was a... a Okay, please. I'm not. A, I'm not the history buff. I should be, but what the Treaty of Versailles, of uh, if I'm saying that right, that essentially, you know, would cripple Germany. Hitler came and actually brought that country back into an operational world power. Obviously, we know what his demise was, but I think a lot of times we we have demonized uh, the positive things that he did. Listen to what I'm saying, because it sounds wild. But nationalism, <laughs> I mean, we have a flag. We should have some nationalism behind it. It's a lot more multicultural than what Hitler was trying to do. But still, the power to bring people together under a flag, the power to bring people together under some sort of symbolism and belief was very, very powerful. And I think what we've done is we've taken someone like Trump and said, well, he's like Hitler. That's what he's trying to do here. And we've demonized that. But look what happens when you have a society that doesn't have any real nationalism. Like now, what are you really fighting for? Every Everyone can claim in a place where there's no true nationalism that they're a minority group. Everybody can say that they're being fucked with. Everybody can just be against. The, I hate to hear people talk about how they hate America and they're clocking in every day. I hate that shit. Like, I don't like how you don't like your country. You don't want to fight, but you're here every day. You call 911 if you have an emergency. I bet you would. I hate people who claim they hood, and then they say, that I hate America. Man, I love Denver Harbor. Man, I hate the United States. What? Man, I love Houston, Texas. Man, I hate the United States. What? <laughs> I get confused. Like, where did you get this ideology from? You know what I mean? And I say, where did you get this ideology from? You say, What? <laughs> <laughs> it's true there's a disconnect in conversation right mm. it's like I'm, not, I'm trying to talk to you but you ain't even listening to me because you're trying to figure out what you're going to do to feed yourself tomorrow like poverty is literally destroying America from the inside out but we can't have a conversation about poverty because we actually say some things like I've heard conservatives say that we have the richest poor people on the planet in which we do like how can you be so poor when you got an iPhone hey like two things can be true simultaneously right the phone is my connection to the whole entire world. Without this thing, it's really hard for me to travel. It's really hard to make purchases. Without this thing, you have no skin in the game. Anyway, that's a disingenuous argument. Yes, there are poor people who live on the streets and have an iPhone. It's fascinating. <laughs> we shame poor people so bad, right? If you make less than $75,000 a year individually, it's really hard to consider yourself middle class because middle class is more like a hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and upper middle class is 250 i wish we could have some fucking claps because i remember this white man telling me this long time ago i was 12 he said you're not really doing anything and this was in the 90s if you're not making at least 100 grand and and guess what 100 grand now annually is still rough and, and I would I would say, yeah, that's like entry level into the middle class. But if you're upper middle class, yeah, we're talking 250, 300. It, it, it really does take a lot to have something here. It does. I don't think a lot of people understand that. And then have a conversation like every person who's broadcasting information to you. They make five hundred thousand dollars a year. They make a million dollars a year talking to you while you make thirty six thousand dollars a year. And you they're so great. Deborah Duncan. She's so amazing. <laughs> Shout out to the Houston lady, man. I think you're doing a fabulous job, but you don't relate to your audience. You're a millionaire. Someone like Don Lemon, these CNN guys, are these, uh, you know, well, with the, with the, I guess the uh, right wing, they're called the left wing media, you know, all of them though, they're, they're getting, they are all in it. That's, that's what I need people to understand is it is a game indeed, because even if they're acting like they're on opposing sides of ideology, 
in class, they're really one. And if they got to protect their class, they're going to protect that first. That's money. That's their livelihood. So, yeah, these guys are, oh, we're just so oppressed. But you're sitting behind that. You're sitting behind that mic uh, as an anchor. And you're making probably half a million dollars a year. You know, who knows? Book deals and all that other shit come. No different than a preacher. Same thing. I want to know what your zip code is. I want to know what the breakdown of the demographic. I want to know the demographics of your neighborhood, Don Lemon. Who's your neighbor? Is he black like you or not? That's what I want to know. What's the percentages in your neighborhood? And I can tell you what you're fighting for. You can never use the word racism ever again when you ain't got no black neighbors. I, I, that's a high take. I, I, and please cut that into a clip so I can share it. I'm TikToking the fuck out of that. <laughs> Oprah, because she couldn't walk into a store, she said racism. Like, come on, lady. Like, how many black women walk into her mess? Like, tell the truth and get some power, please. But I'm Oprah. She's supposed to. How narcissistic is that? That she's supposed to know that you're the one black billionaire woman on the planet that's walking into their store. What are the odds of that? It's like winning the lotto. <laughs> I really do think we've become complainers. Uh, we haven't really tried to find alternatives or create alternative uh, product that we'll support. You know, we just we're constantly begging for others to accept us and change their rules. I want to say this too. A white man don't got to like me. He has every reason to believe what he believe and not like me. He just can't, but I have the right to fuck him up if he infringes on my rights, but he doesn't have, we got to get out of this. We want white people to like us so fucking much. You can't legislate feelings. And that is so crazy mm. because that ideology has permeated. It's permeated our culture. Now we have all these people who are saying, you have to like my sexual orientation because we had niggas who said you have to like me because of the color of my skin. Nigga, I don't give a fuck if you like me. I think hate is completely natural. I want you to hate me, baby. But if you touch me, like my man Malcolm said, nigga, you will never touch another black man ever again. Come here, boy. I like it. I get excited. <laughs> <laughs> I just get excited, you know. We need some. In we need intellectuals like us to enter into the conversation so we can explain this. You can feel how you want just as long as those feelings don't control what's going on over here. But that's very true. We are legislating feelings. The greatest American alive. The greatest American alive. The greatest American alive. The greatest American alive. The greatest American alive.